Hi, Rich. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Hey, it's good to see you. How you doing? Good, good. I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, we're sort of fresh off a few weeks ago, finishing the micro solidarity course that you and Nati ran. And uh, I really enjoyed that. It was very, very powerful for me and uh, the, the learning the framework. And also I love the, I love the two week format that was just right after doing so many like five, six week courses or whatever. Uh, it was, it was precious to have a two week course. Uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, um, how was your experience running that cohort? It was cool. Um, I think this is the sixth round or something. Um, and we, we iterate every time and, mm -hmm. and change it up. Um, but it's getting to the point now where it feels very easy. You know, it's like, oh, it's the thing we do, blah, 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 blah. And both Nati and I get a real pleasure out of the craft of facilitation and making everything just like silky smooth. Um, so I feel like we're at that point now where we're really humming. Uh, so it's really fun. Um, but I guess the reason I sort of squint and think about it for a second is the part that I don't enjoy is because there's like, we're doing two cohorts of like 30 people each. Uh, we don't actually get to connect with people really. You know, so we're hosting and sending people off and they're all connecting with each other. And in, in this group in particular, I really wanted to drop in with people, but didn't really have much of a chance. So I'm left with a little bit of a like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like I organized the party, but didn't get to dance. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, for me, a lot of the sort of intimate connection has come from uh, the crews that have spawned after the cohort uh, that, mm. you know, you sort of had this opportunity at the end to create crews for shared interests. And uh, that's felt like I've had two meetings now with a crew that formed after that. And that's felt a lot more like intimate and connected. So um I, I know I can relate to that as well insofar as like yeah I mean I think during the course it was like you're talking to people for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes and it, uh, even that on the participant side was like a little bit less uh, less connecting than sort of the crews have been so um, why did you I, I, I can guess but I'd be curious to hear you describe it I, I know you focused this last cohort on uh, like Twitter people specifically, like not exclusively, but there was sort of an intention. Um, would you mind describing like what the intention was there and what your hopes were with that? Mm. Um, I have to be honest. I can kind of develop a logic in retrospect, but I often make these kind of decisions on some kind of gut feel. Mm -hmm. And some days I just wake up with a bolt of enthusiasm and, and, um, yeah, I had this sense of like, I would really like to just offer something to the Twitter mutuals that are like not quite friends, but feels like we're getting more and more friendly with each other. Uh, just to see how that would land. I didn't really think about it. I just put the offer out and immediately got a really warm response. So I was like, oh, great. Um, I think it's like, I'm living in a place in Luca in Italy with my partner Nati. And that's the extent of my local community. I mean, we know a few people, but I don't, I haven't got really meaningful connections with people here. And so I've been spending more time on Twitter um, since we've been here than in the past. And I noticed that I was like, I'm getting some of my social needs met by being on Twitter. But I had this weird kind of recognition that I'm using Twitter like interactive TV. Like there's all these characters and there's these storylines and jokes and memes and stuff, but there's something inhumane about the people, you know, there's something, and, and I was just kind of interrogating for myself. What is it like, what is it about this relationship? You know, they talk about parasocial relationships. And I think the, the divide, dividing line for me is about mutual obligation. It's like a friend is someone you can count on, you know, it's like, Hey, I'm really sick. Can you come help me out? Yes. If you're my friend. Whereas if someone on Twitter is like, I've had this bad thing happen, I can just scroll past, you know? <laughs> it's like, I get to decide if I'm engaging or not. And there's no real sense of obligation to each other. And that um, it's fun, it's nice, but it just kind of lacks a kind of depth. And, and I've noticed, I think I'm actually a bit of a latecomer on this, but I've noticed that there's a lot of people on Twitter that are actually making genuine friendships. They're not just doing the parasocial interactive tv thing they're actually getting to know each other 
spending time, you know, traveling, meeting each other, spending time in each other's places, forming relationships that really make a difference to their life. Um, and so I guess I, I noticed that that was an option and started testing it out for myself and just in little, you know, like little gestures, like sending someone a private message instead of something in public, already that changes the dynamic. So th that was part of my path inwards to creating more meaningful relationships. And then one of the things I noticed kind of to, to my surprise, most of the people I interact with on Twitter don't really know much about me or my credentials or, you know, like what I think I know about myself. <laughs> they like something about the way that I act, but they don't actually know much about what I have to offer in a practical way. So I had the sense of like, I would like people to know better about what I do, what I got to offer. Um, so I made the offer and yeah, a lot of people signed up and we had a great time. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm already noticing a lot of like sort of second order effects of these, the framework being available to people in the Twitter sphere. And I think those ripples will continue to uh, sort of proliferate in the, in the months and years to come. Um, yeah, that, that, that sort of connects nicely to, would love to just hear from you, kind of zoom out and hear about your own background and life story and whatever you'd like to share about that. Would love to hear it. Sure. Um, maybe I can start from Luca. Like, what, what am I doing in Italy? Mm. Um, as you can hear, I'm not Italian. I've got one of these weird versions of English <laughs> accents that is, um, I've learned to recognize now, actually, this is a particular accent of people that have traveled quite a, quite a bunch. It's this like distorted, well, I'm from New Zealand, but it gets distorted by having spent mm, most of the last six years outside of New Zealand. And I don't know how to do a proper New Zealand accent anymore. It's this like <laughs> very distorted thing. Um, but I grew up in the middle of nowhere, right? Like on a farm, I like to road, ride motorcycles and shoot guns and stuff. Um, and, and we were like in a small town in New Zealand. So not just, you know, New Zealand's already remote, but then in a small part of it. And then we were raised in this uh, quite peculiar Christian church. So that's also remote in terms of kind of cultural norms. It's quite, um, if you imagine like the Netherlands in 1950 or something, it's kind of, that was how we grew up. It's really old fashioned. Uh, interpretation of religion and really, really quite uptight fundamentalist Christian church, you know. Um, and I was really bought into that. I really thought that was the the answer because <laughs> everyone around me was reinforcing that yes, this is the way, the truth, and the light. And um, then I kind of moved out of home, went to the big city of Wellington, which is like three hundred thousand people. Um, went to engineering school, university, got exposed to like different ways of thinking, punk music, took some drugs, you know, <laughs> like just uh, slowly lit, kind of came out of the very tightly cloistered bubble that I'd been in and lost my sense of um, certainty in my beliefs. And never went, I never did this big like rejection of, of God or something, but um i like to think at least it's more of a transcendence like i can i'm down with christians that's great but i'm just not really down with the exclusive part i'm not really willing to say that the buddhists and the hindus and everyone else they're all wrong and ignorant and evil something like i couldn't really get that but um and so the process of of coming out of that fundamentalist faith also was coming out of community so eventually i got excommunicated from our church which is interpreted differently by different people, but um, it kind of means I'm going to hell. It's kind of like the official stamp that says uh, I'm apostate because I had I was given the truth and then I chucked it away. Mm. Um, my family's not so intense about it, so like I'm, I'm I've still got a pretty good relationship with my family, but a lot of the other church people, I'm I'm officially a bad guy. So I lost all of my community, all of my community. Um, and I guess that has been motivating a lot of what I've been doing since because leaving a fundamentalist, not even just fundamentalist, but leaving a like comprehensive faith tradition is kind of shitty. <laughs> like 
it's um, what the world has on offer. It's not that appealing. Like it's just a lot of uncertainty and subjectivity and fluidity and like strife and um, kind of impossible questions and paradoxes and stuff and no good answers. That's, that's kind of what you get when you leave the church. <laughs> it's not that nice. Um, so I had a hard few years of uh, being disconnected from people and not really knowing how to fit in anywhere or like what was true or yeah. Um, and then the Occupy movement kicked off in 2011 and that just, yeah, supercharged me, just really activated me in a way that I had never really been activated before. Um, I just got super inspired by this amazing self-organizing community that came out of nowhere, like both in the local context in Wellington, but also in the global context of being part of a network of a thousand cities, people under this banner, very vague banner called Occupy. Um, suddenly I was plugged in again, you know, it's like, ah, there's a new community. Um, it's much more tolerant. It's much more pluralistic. There's many more different ways of thinking going on. And at least in our local context, people, there was like this constant debate, um, this collision between different ways of thinking, different perspectives, people from all sorts of different parts of different life stories. And no one was too concerned about being right or like finding the one true thing, but more like what happens when we collide all these different perspectives together. And that was just so inspiring and such a healing kind of contrast to what I'd been raised with this, this singular narrative about everything, you know, one answer for every question you come up with is always an answer. This was just like this flourishing of the questions in a really fun way. And I got to witness firsthand collective intelligence as a super organism you know, that, that a group with the right process and the right amount of trust can just become superhuman. It just, it just has this kind of brilliance and um, yeah, it kind of humbled me in a way. Like I'm not that humble of a person, but <laughs> um, it, it, the humility is like, it showed me over and over again that it doesn't matter what the topic is, I'm never going to be the smartest person on the topic. Like no individual is going to be the smartest person. The, the smartest person is always going to be a well-oiled group. Like you just, our, our perspectives are always so limited. And if you get five people together, you can just see so much more of what's going on in reality uh, with that collective intelligence. So that was just like, yeah, it's hard to, to summarize in retrospect, this like massive upgrade in my personal operating system. But it gave me a lot of enthusiasm. I guess it like supercharged my enthusiasm budget. <laughs> and um, sometimes I use the metaphor of like, uh, you know, like those big birds of prey that go up on the updrafts around the cliffs and then they like glide around for hours. It, it was kind of like that. Like it sent me, it was like an updraft that sent me so super high in altitude. And I've kind of been cruising ever since. And that was like 10 years ago. I've never really had to come down since then. I felt like a sense of meaning and purpose ever since then that has been fueling me. Um, and so then it's just been like one thing after another of bumbling along, <laughs> trying to, yeah, trying to be of benefit in the world, you know, like trying to connect uh, what's my unique perspective and competence and how does it serve the needs in the world. And so that started with a software project called Lumio, which is really quite a simple translation of Occupy style decision-making onto the computer. And then immediately from there into this community called Inspiral, which I'm really happy to talk about more. Um, a peer support community of people doing social impact work. And that's been totally awesome. Um, and then I kind of had this question of how to start more Inspirals because it's, it's a trust-based network. It's like 150 people. It doesn't get much bigger than that um, because most of the governance happens by conversation and friendship. Uh, it's been hugely impactful in my life and most people would love something like that, which combines belonging, like long-term committed belonging where people care about you and meaningful work, like having a job that you care about, that you have a lot of autonomy and sense of purpose. And most of the people that I encounter in my world would love those two things. Um, and we can't all fit them in in spiral. And so 
the micro solidarity is kind of the answer of like how do we how do we make lots of those what what do people need to start their own version their own peer support community that makes a big difference in their life hmm. Hmm. so um it seems like the the sort of mental model i've been working off of is that uh in spiral is like a specific collective that functions for a specific purpose in a specific place with specific people and then micro solidarity is sort of uh abstracted out from that like what the best practices are that have worked at Inspiral so that they could be used elsewhere and uh adapted to different contexts is that fair to say yeah and um it's actually really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to de decouple what are the design patterns from the specific context. And, and the process has been over the last, like I said, I've been traveling for like five or six years. A lot of what's happening in that travel, and now I'm traveling online, you know, um, meeting with people in all sorts of different contexts. Um, it's just that the, the, a lot of what I'm learning about is not like, it's not like a formal study of sociology or group process or something. It's an informal study of what are all the things I took for granted from my local context? Like what comes easily to us in our group for whatever reason, because of the specific people or the culture or who knows what, um, what comes easy that other people are struggling with. And it's just like this constant process of excavating. And <laughs> it turns out like, ah, everything's context. <laughs> there's like no content, there's almost no content. And when I actually got to stripping out what's the actual content, it's like, you should organize in groups of five people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ta-da, that's, that's the whole thing. <laughs> like meet in small groups regularly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the, the biggest uh, sort of download is quite small that I got from micro solidarity, but like is extremely impactful, which was like to, to like bound the time that your small group meets. Uh, it's like, whoa, that's why groups fail or have problems after times because like the intention shifts or the people change or whatever. But if you bound the time, uh, like that we're going to do this for a month or three months or whatever, uh, that, that has some power to like, yeah, like revisit it afterwards and so on. And, uh, yeah, that alone was like totally worth the course experience of like, oh, that that will be very helpful <laughs> to bound the time that this small group meets. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I just I think about that as an example of a container. Mm -hmm. And I, and I've been really attentive lately to the way that it seems like all growth, all development happens inside of a container. You know, it's like ba babies don't just grow in the air. Like, <laughs> you know, they, they're incubated in the womb. And and even when we were adults and we we're like developing in different ways. There's a lot of work you have to do on your own in a sense that like you have to do. You, you can't like, you can't expect someone else to do it for you. A lot of this um, internal development, but still it seems like there are other people involved in creating the context for your growth. And so the small group can be a, a context for an individual to grow, but also the, t the time container as well. And, and saying like these people for this time, and then in a month, it might be different people, it might be different time, different purpose, different configuration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear any like sort of stories or learnings that you had as you've had this adaptation process, like things maybe that you thought were essential that proved not to be, or things that you didn't know were essential, but turned out to be, or like anything that really surprised you or, or something like that. Um, I, th I think the most recent example of a like aha moment of what I've inherited is so two years ago uh, when Nati and I decided to settle in, in Europe, we, we put our hands up to help host a, a kind of regional in spiral here. So we call it in spiral Europe. And we intended to have a gathering because that's what we like to do, get people together for four or five days. And then the pandemic came on just just at the you know just at the time to interrupt that plan, and so then we had this like two year period or eighteen months or something of um, deferred enthusiasm, <laughs> you know, meeting online, kind of having some sense of connection, but none of the real juicy stuff, and and then we finally got people together in August in France, and we had a retreat, and it was so sweet. 
it was just like this combination of lots of freedom, really good food, a nice river, a nice big house that we're in. Uh, and also real depth, you know, people bringing practices to share and like workshop sessions and good conversations and like deep sharing spaces and like just a really exquisite, exquisite community experience. And the whole time I kind of had this thing in the back of my head, like, why are we trying to extend and spiral, which is this New Zealand rooted community across the other side of the world? Like it makes things a bit more complicated to have to do like international governance and stuff. Um, why don't we just start something from scratch? And the thing that really like sealed the deal for me was at the end of the retreat without, like I was one of the organizers and one of the instigators of the, like someone who's really calling this energy together. At the end of the retreat, two people put their hand up to host the next one. And without any real prompting or anything, it was just like a spontaneous like, oh, we're excited about how this is going. We feel qualified to do the next one. We feel a sense of ownership to do the next one. And like that is, in retrospect, that was the highlight for me. I mean, the end, the fact that I trust them, like I trust their competence and their character and everything to do the job as well. Like I'm really happy that they get to take a turn leading and I'll just be a participant in the next one. Um, and that made me realize like, oh, this is the value of Inspiral is that, there's something in that collective identity where people have this expectation of a particular kind of leadership, which is like, it is centralized in the sense that if you're hosting an event, you're gonna call a lot of the shots. Like you're not a dictator or a boss, but you do set a lot of the terms, you make a lot of decisions and people's choices, either they participate or they don't. We're not doing a lot of consensus building all the time about what's this event gonna look like. But <laughs> we rotate, we take turns. So like. I had my turn and then someone else is going to have their turn in a couple of months and then and the next and the next. And so in that way, we've it feels like we've kind of solved the leadership paradox that really upsets people a lot. You know, the um, are we going to do everything by consensus? Are we going to have this kind of strict hierarchy? And it's like, no, we're not going to do either of those things. And, and if it had not been for Inspiral, if people hadn't arrived with that set of expectations, I, it's very unlikely, I think, that anyone would have felt permission to put their hand up to host the next one. They would have assumed, well, you led this one, so probably that means you'll lead the next one, right? Um, so that's an example of something that I kind of took for granted because it's been that way for the last 10 years that I've been participating in Inspiral, that there's been this real focus on shared leadership. Um, and it made me, it's one of these things where it's like, oh, right, this, this needs to be written down. Like people need to know that this is a thing. That this is actually a very specific approach, a very specific set of practices. And there's a lineage now, at least of 10 years, and it's connected to the deeper lineage than that as well. But that there is best practice. There's a track record here of this working. Um, so that's kind of the work now that I'm on is, is just, okay, I've done that first layer of saying you should meet in small groups. <laughs> but then there's the second layer. There is a bunch of nuance around leadership and conflict and accountability and how does someone qualify to be taking on these leadership positions all that kind of stuff is kind of living in my implicit i've got some knowledge or guesses or hunches that live in my tummy um i'm in the process now of like articulating all that stuff and sharing it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that has me curious about like yeah sort of zooming out again like how you think about your time and projects currently like big picture sort of how you're balancing the different efforts you're doing and how they how they relate to each other hmm. i don't know <laughs> uh -huh. yeah <laughs> let's find out um i had like when i first when i first published the micro solidarity proposal it's the end of 2018 and it, and it opens with this, this really apocalyptic framing and because at the time I was really committed to this thing of like, hey, everyone, it's the end of the world. It's time to get on with something different. Don't you think it's important that we stop killing the planet? And, you know, which I still, I still think it's important that we stop killing the planet and try a different way of living, um, you know, in harmony with the rest of nature instead of always fighting it. But just the way that things have changed or the way that I've changed in the last three years, it feels less useful to repeat this apocalyptic framing 
like I think there's now we're now in this phase where people are getting scolded a lot uh, from different sources about like I don't know it, it feels like there's this kind of energy of you should feel bad or ashamed or scared or something about the future and I just don't think that's very generative so um so I'm trying to like the work that I'm in is like trying to be of benefit <laughs> that's the big project trying to move through space encounter people and and leave them a little better than I found them uh and do that in a way that is also leaving me better you know that it's not um that it's win-win that we're both growing through the process that it's not like I'm getting exhausted um and that's the big project and as it manifests it's like huh I seem to have a lot of opinions and some amount of expertise and I don't know which one's which but a lot of opinions on communities and organizational design and and how to get organized uh when it's kind of like once you once you say I don't want a traditional hierarchy if you've already said that then I suddenly I've got a lot of opinions about what comes next <laughs> um I don't want to convince anyone to get rid of the hierarchy but once they've crossed that threshold then then I've got a lot, a lot to say on the topic um and so the way it all fits together is like Lumio is a software platform that non-hierarchical groups use for decision making uh, the hum is a training company which supports groups with the practical skills necessary to like actually develop a culture that collective decision making sits on top of you know which is like shared responsibility mutual accountability giving each other feedback making um having the feedback that happens on top of the decision so like being able to reflect on how are these decisions actually going once we've made them on the tool um so there's that that kind of more social intervention rather than a technical intervention and then and then micro solidarity is like i want to be in a network of communities i want to be surrounded by peers who have committed themselves to the path of holding community and by community i really mean that what i call the congregation scale so like 50 to 150 people there's a specific set of skills and challenges to be one of the people in the middle of that holding it together I want to be surrounded by a really awesome community of peers that are learning how to do that well. And so that's currently where I'm at with the micro solidarity network is like activating these community founders so that they can support me. Um, Cause I've been feeling a bit lonely uh, as in so many people having opinions about how organizations should be different or about how communities should be different or society should be different, but very few people with experience at that at that medium sort of scale um so i want to help people get activated on that and so we can learn from each other because it seems really important somehow but yeah like as i think as you can hear me describe it it's not a particularly coherent it doesn't feel particularly coherent as a vision it's more like like i said i wake up in the morning and what feels what calls me i do that for a bit and then yeah. i move on to the next thing yeah, sure. Me too. Uh, it's nice to just kind of get an overview of, of what the different things are and how they fit together. And um, would it, you know, coming back to this, um, you know, you talked about the, the micro solidarity proposal having sort of this apocalyptic framing or, or you know, um, we talked about it over the summer on Twitter as like memes being laced in. Um, and is it fair to say, like, from I'm hearing from you almost that it was sort of like a strategic shift to talk about it differently where it's like well these things may still be true i may still hold them this way but it's not useful to shame people or scold people it doesn't have any benefit and so it's it it sounds like it's not so much of a shift of like oh there's a different future that's possible or i'm seeing something different but just this is what's beneficial or useful is is that true um I, it's pretty much i think what's shifted is my my ability to sit with uncertainty has mm. developed a bit more so like um it did feel very important a few years ago like all the way from 2006 was the first time i think that there was a there was a report from the un about we're in the sixth mass extinction it was the first time that I had sort of heard of that concept was 2006. 
And the, you know, I mentioned in my intro that there was a period of my life that was pretty dark. That was part of it, was the sense of like, hey, this is really important. Like we're destroying our habitat and you can tell because all the animals are dying. Uh, and we're part of it, you know, it's not like, it's not like we get away with that without a bruise. Um, and I could see that way back then. And it's just like, obviously no one, very little number of people, very few people in power were, were responding to that with anything like sanity. Um, so it was really distressing. And then 2011 with Occupy was the first time I met a critical mass of people that all agreed, like we're on a collision course with something that could terminate civilization or if not terminate civilization at least we're talking about like millions and millions of people dying like massive destruction of the ecosphere um that was my like meeting other people that shared it was like this private fear that and grief that suddenly i got to connect with all these other people and that was so empowering and exciting to discover like wow there's a lot of us that are afraid and once we get organized, that like we've got power, we can do stuff. So it was really important for me to, to sort of ring the alarm bell and say, business as usual can't go on. Things have to change. Um, and then, you know, you have Extinction Rebellion kicked off. I think that was also 2018. I'm not sure. Um, and, and that for me sort of marked the it was between Extinction Rebellion and, and Greta Thunberg that sort of marks the high watermark of, hey, everyone, we should freak out. <laughs> um, and, and so since then, I've sort of felt like it's strategic to pivot a little. And when I said about uncertainty, it's like, it means that I don't know what's coming. And there are lots of signs, like very concrete signs, uh, reasons to be fearful or, or to be scared about what's coming. But we don't actually know. Like, and, and because I was so committed to this, like we need to raise the alarm, I'd actually shut myself down on a lot of the positive possibilities. Um, there's this short book called Rethinking Humanity from a um, think tank called Rethink X. And it's kind of like this very hype, um, very Californian, like optimistic, technology is gonna save the day kind of narrative, which was very triggering for me to read. But even just spending a bit of time, like it took me a couple of hours to read the thing and just sinking into that perspective for a couple of hours. And they're like, yeah, things are bad, but like, imagine if we cracked the, the energy problem, like we've got tons of solar panels and tons of wind power, and we've just got an abundance of, of energy that's really cheap. Think about all the amazing things we could do. And like, All right, yeah, true. <laughs> there are, <laughs> and, and just like actually opening up to the possibilities of things that could go really well, as well as the possibilities of things that could go horribly wrong. Um, again, it's a kind of a kind of humility. It's kind of opened me up to, I don't know what's coming, and I have this deep psychological urge to latch on to a sense of certainty and construct a story. Oh, it's the end of the world. Collapse, collapse, collapse existential risk i'll form my identity around this i'll form my tribe around this um but we don't actually know we don't know what's coming we might have nuclear fusion next year and that'll solve a lot of problems um there might be aliens you know and who knows what's going to come next and and i yeah i've just found it for me it's really useful to be in a space of possibility and not to get there by uh, delusion or intoxication or like spiritual bypassing or just, you know, uh, I just won't look at all the things that are sad and scary. Like that's not very satisfying for an intelligent person, but to look at all the stuff, to feel the feelings and then to still find reasons to be hopeful, you know, just to, to, not to just be hopeful as an emotion, but to be hopeful as a, as a path in life, as an action, as a mission. Like I'm going to go around and be a reason to be hopeful. <laughs> I want to be a reason for other people to be hopeful. Yeah. Um, really glad to hear about that because um, I don't know, I think I've come from a similar background and trajectory and uh, sort of the same sort of inner machinations have been happening of like, 
yeah, just being open to many futures and many possibilities and yeah, as you say, uncertainty and um, there are signs of some things happening and signs of other things happening and that all kinds of things could happen that we couldn't possibly predict. And, uh, you know, we have to act on what we know, but uh, who knows what will happen in the future. So it's, it's nice to hear you talk about that because it is, it is uncertain, as you say. Yeah. There's another piece of it actually, which is about, it kind of came from me studying a little bit more about cults. Mm. because this is the big um, risk of the work that I'm doing with creating templates for people to form community. Like the communities we're forming are really intense. They're really like, it's about intimacy and vulnerability and authenticity and forming quite, you know, ritual and forming these, these solid connections with each other, which can all be used for coercive ways of building belonging, you know, these coercive cults. Um, and so it's been important for me that that part of the download that you get with microsolidarity also immunizes you somewhat against those kinds of abuses of power. And as I started reading more about cults, there's a page on the microsolidarity website about cults to go and research if you want to follow it up yourself. But the thing that a lot of them have in common is this apocalyptic framing. Because if we've got such an epic mission, such as you know the preservation of life on earth, it just justifies the most absurd means to get there and 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 it made me realize like huh <laughs> if i'm saying that we should do this you know we should do this particular form of community building because this is going to be your lifeboat your solution when civilization collapses um yeah it just kind of leaves the door open for all kinds of absurdities and it's just as true to say you should do this kind of community building because it feels good and it's nutritious for your soul uh, and it helps you be a better neighbor and a better partner. Uh, and when you say those things, when you, when you just say this is about friendship and having a life worth living, it kind of, I think, leaves less room for demagogues and yeah, you know, really distorted kind of ethics, which says, oh yeah, of course we're going to do this, this weird sex and drug ritual because it's the end of the world and we need to bust through to the next paradigm or something you know it just makes it a little bit more sober um to just get rid of all that stuff and just get focused on friendship <laughs> being kind those sorts of things is that focus on friendship and being kind and, and community for the sake of a meaningful life is that the main like uh deterrent for cults forming through micro solidarity or are there other are there other sort of immunizations, as you say, that you're building into it or that you encourage? Uh, one of them is about transparency. Mm. So cults usually thrive in the dark. Um, and you, one of the fun things about designing the framework is that um, I get to, like you say, lace a bunch of memes into it. So one of the memes, like I described with the Inspiral Retreat, that there's this expectation of distributed rotating leadership and assuming there's a bunch of these micro solidarity communities around the world operating the same way, pretty soon there'll be these memes kind of lying around in culture, which is like, oh, you're a, you have inherited a bunch of stuff from micro solidarity. That tells me a little bit about what I can expect from the leadership there. Um, so by that mechanism, I, I hope to, yeah, leave quite a, quite a lot of vaccines <laughs> against abuse of power. So it's like, transparency, uh, being suspicious of epic purpose and, 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 and trying to find meaningful ways to just ground in more pragmatic purposes. Um, I think it's a big part about like creating cultures of authenticity where people can talk about whatever they need to talk about and that then they're not feeling constantly hounded by social pressure of like, oh, we don't talk about that. Well, that's not a thing that we can talk about. And so, for example, that would mean I would expect in any community, once it starts to mature to a certain point, there should be conversations about leadership and about power and influence and like, what does this terrain of status look like in this group? And is it distributed the way that we want it? And do people have access when they need it? And if it's not equal, because it, I don't think it ever is, 
um, do we need to take proactive steps to level it out a bit more and give people more opportunities to gain status? Um, like talking about status is something that's huge taboo in most groups. And I think one of the antidotes to abuse of power is like you bring it out into the open and you make it something that's talked about. So there's a bunch of stuff like that. Um, and then also the other part is really focusing on empowering the small group that like the small groups kind of where all the action is not the large group. Um, it's not about a hundred people all surrounding one special figure. It's about a few slightly special figures, just creating the context for all the small groups to form. And, and that's where the attention is. The attention is not on the, on the organizing hosting people. They're kind of functionary, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, you talked about like, you sort of an extreme example for what cults are and you're like, oh yeah, the sex and drug thing. And certainly there's examples of that, but I imagine you've been exposed to sort of more, um, you know, less, less acute forms of culty behavior. And what are some of the kinds of things that you've seen that are like um, anti-patterns for community that maybe are like less, uh, less sort of blatant, but are still problematic. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's well before the cult phase. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of what I wrote in the original proposal was addressing what I felt were anti-patterns in community formation. Mm -hmm. So like a good example is the whole burner culture where you have, obviously there's like the home base of Burning Man, but then this this international network of burns and then not just the events, but the sort of expanding community around it. Just like I described with Occupy, a lot of other people will go to a burn and have the sense of like, ah, oh, I found my people. And it's hugely intoxicating, um, kind of in a positive and in a negative sense. Like there's this amazing relief, like, oh, it's not just me. There's these other people here um, that see, see the world a little bit like I see it or that, that um, we're all mutually giving each other permission to be ourselves or something like that's happening. And it's fun, it's super, super celebration. Um, but what tends to happen in those communities outside of the week long gathering is very unstructured. They usually have like a Facebook group and some shared houses and some parties. And tends to be Within that culture, there tends to be people experimenting like outside of conservative ideas about monogamy or about drug use or alcohol or, you know, like that there's, there's this real radical experimentation culture. People stepping outside of traditional boundaries and going, no, nah, we don't need all those rules. We're going to do things differently. Uh, and I, I think the experimentation with social forms without structure is really like a recipe for a lot of people to get hurt. And I've just seen it a lot. Um, and, and by hurt, it comes at different levels. There's the, the I think the most common one is um, someone who feels very connected and is like showing up at all the events and having a great time. And then something happens in their life where they're not well or, you know, they've got a chronic illness is a common one. And they can't participate in the same way. And they kind of don't get any support. Mm. They, they, they're like, they're no longer showing up. And so they become invisible and everyone kind of forgets about them. And maybe they've got one or two friends that, that care, but most people, there's no, there's no structure to hold them. There's none of that container, like I described, um, for people to notice like, Hey, this person is not here. Um, because there's no hard boundaries. There's no, like, this is who's in and this is who's out. And then the small groups thing, like, um, I wanted people to really understand the basic social physics of like, if you have 500 people and one person's not there, no one's gonna notice. But if you have five people and one person's not there, it's really obvious. Um, so that's just like a, a, a minor example. It's not very dramatic, but I think, it, I think a lot of people have been burned by that sense of like really hyped. This is gonna be awesome. I found my people, there's so much love and compassion. And then when they need it, it's not there. And then they get kind of turned off on the whole project. Um, and then from there, it just gets progressively worse and more toxic. So um, I think there's a lot of stuff around people bonding over these peculiar, like um, complementary traumas 
and then often the bond uh, becomes sexual and then because it's trauma-based like it gets really bad <laughs> and and then we have this like oh god what do we do it feels like you were manipulating me and I was manipulating you and I've got this massive regrets or this sense of like sometimes a feeling of being abused and who do I go to like who are the elders that I turn to for advice or accountability or justice like oh we have to invent some kind of community accountability process which tends to be extremely expensive in terms of people's attention and their emotional energy and like burns a whole ton of social capital and like yeah not knowing how to handle the ugliness of sexuality like that's just torched so many people and again they're like oh this community actually sucks it's actually really dangerous and what's the alternative this modern life of having an atomic family with a picket fence and you know <laughs> just disconnect from that whole thing because it broke my heart uh i just see a lot of that happening as well and my answer is like yeah you need governance like <laughs> you need some kind of structure it doesn't have to be deadening and you know bureaucratic um but we need we need containers we need the ability to go like hey something went down here that was no good and how do we how do we rebuild trust and make a bend make amends how do we give each other difficult feedback um what's the role of like punishment versus forgiveness like i think we need both of those things for a, a really thriving community uh, but if there's no structure if there's no like organizational memory if there's no constitutional mechanisms you're just kind of relying on the vibe or the particular personality of the people that are involved or like the rumor mill to kind of do its work. And none of those I think are really effective in the long run. And so if we're building alternative social forms that are going to go the distance, like they actually really need, they need a lot of evolution. There's a lot of parts that need to really work. And if you look at like churches, for example, they evolved all those parts, you know, like the church that I grew up in had lots of different components to become a long-term sustainable thing. And it's not just a story about God or Christianity. It's like specific organizational forms that um, make a whole organism that has different organs and that it, and it can last a long time. What are some of those organs or functions that you see recurring for, say, the, the different congregations or groups of that size will need? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say at this point because the communities that I'm mostly supporting at the moment are all in a similar like startup phase, which is all about, they're all like 18 months old, calling the first members in. Um, they'll be having retreats. So that's definitely a, an organ. One of the most important organs is like, can we have a gathering once or twice a year where a critical mass of our community get together and they deepen their bonds? Um, they're able to reflect on what's been happening in the past and like upgrade our, upgrade our agreements or like set new, um, make decisions, you know, set new priorities for what we're going to do next and, and have sufficient bumping time for new collaborations to really form. It's like, really hard to get collaborations to form through online connection. But when you put 50 people in a room for three days, then like tons of new stuff happens. Um, so that's one, that's definitely one of the organs. Um, but yeah, the communities I'm mostly involved with at the moment are all at that stage of like just starting to learn, okay, we need gatherings, we need crews. Occasionally we might need to have more of like a plenary where people can get together and, and meet online. Um, and they haven't really graduated beyond that, um, but I know that that next layer is coming. So what I see as a kind of guess is that what comes next, it's, well, it really depends on scale as well. So there's the first thing of like, what are some basic practices that support a small group to have a good time together? So like there's a whole library of different practices that you can use for like deepening connection and insight and getting advice and being coaches for each other and doing different relational practices. So there's that. But then once you get, you know, 30 people or something, 50 people, you're probably going to have to make decisions at some point, like who gets to join 
and what do we do when there's a conflict and these sorts of things you know um again because of the social physics of group size when you have 50 people you've got like some exponential number of relationships between all those 50 people and it's impossible to have 50 people all having a high degree of trust in all the other people in that room there's always going to be some tension and frustration and like bruised relationships so there needs to be mechanisms you need to learn how to design and operate mechanisms for recovering trust and, and renewing it um so there's like all of these skills and and techniques that need to come in so that it's at a certain scale there will probably be a small group who's dedicated to conflict mediation and transformation um good vibes you know like how do we restore the vibes when things get difficult um and then there's a money thing as well so both just like organizing events involves money but also for me part of the aspiration for the, a lot of these groups is about our working life and um that means investing in each other sometimes you know like being being having the financial infrastructure in place so that you can send money to someone when it seems like um it's going to be supportive for them or somehow good for the community so there's like, like again it's like a whole set of competencies involved with how do you handle money like are you going to do it in this new crypto land or are you going to do it in the in the traditional way and if you're doing it the traditional way then what are all the legal requirements and the taxes and the oh did you know if you use that system you pay 10 percent fees and this one you pay 1.5 percent fees and that all well, there's like a, a whole stack of different skills involved um and how do we want to accommodate people who don't have money and you know um so it's a bit like a village where over time like a thriving village is going to have the baker and the butcher and you know all these different kind of skills that need to come online um and it's a it's a combination of group size and longevity that these different functions are going to come online um at some point you're probably going to have elections you know or something like it so that people can be put into a into a, a leadership role temporarily and that there's some accountability around them um maybe maybe you want to have a group that does strategy I don't really like those, but some groups like those. <laughs> um, there's lots of these kind of things that make it look more like an organization over time, I guess. Um, but I don't really know yet which, like, what the real strong patterns are. It's, this is to be discovered. Right, right. What, what um, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but what are the, what's your sort of hope with focusing on building congregations, and what are you hoping to create there? Um, at the moment, I'm personally in contact with about 30 of them. Uh, and these are all groups of between 30 and 200 people. And they're all committed to, in their own words, I mean, my words is they're, they're trying to be a benefit in the world. They're trying to create spaces for belonging and, and, and meaning and purpose. Um, that just seems like a good thing to exist. And, and then the... Um, networking those groups together uh, just accelerates our learning process and makes it less likely that any one of us is going to collapse. So like one of the reasons I'm always talking about the crew in the congregation is when your crew is struggling, one of your congregation mates can, can help you fix it. Or even if your crew disintegrates, you're part of a wider congregation. So you get to just like the there's like a composting that goes on you get to recompose into another group whereas if you don't have that congregation container if your crew disintegrates you kind of like you just go and all the energy and the lessons and the resources they just kind of like they're not contained and so it's the same with like having in this network now of congregations is that um we can help each other when we're struggling i think especially like i say in this um early stages there's some really key things you want to get right and we can't expect anyone to like have all the answers so when you're struggling with like financial situation or um the power dynamics of like oh this founder is really good but also a bit of a power tripper like what do we do about that it'd be really good to have peers to to help debug these things um and then as they mature a bit i just think of it as like a just a more sophisticated social network that's got more reach and more competence. So like where I'm from in Wellington, 
um, it's very common. It's kind of normal that when you leave home, you know, for university, so you're like 18, 19 years old, until you get married, maybe late 20s, 30, uh, you spend all that time, like a decade in shared housing with other adults, you know, so there's like five, six, seven people in a big house. It's really normal. And in Wellington, there's this um, completely opaque, but super active system of sorting people into the right house. There's these kind of like mega houses and each of them has their own distinctive flavor because that one's a little bit more political and this one's a bit more musical and this one's a bit more punks. And, um, and if you're a new person in town, you just need to go to one party from one of those mega houses and you'll be routed efficiently towards like, oh, your people are kind of over there and they'll help you find the actual specific place to live, you know, and like yeah. the parties to go to and the introductions you need. Um, and this network must be, I don't know, there must be thousands and thousands of people in it. Um, this is what happens when you have a tightly contained, like the, the city of Wellington is in this very tight boundary between steep mountains and a harbor. Um, so it's all really held in there. And then we're in New Zealand, so it's far away from everything. So it's hard to get away. Uh, it met, there's this like critical mass of connections and mutual knowledge so that people, everyone knows everyone. So you can kind of route people through the system um also has some downsides but it's really good for helping people to find their place I, I i think i'm trying to reconstruct something like that but that's not geographically limited um it's limited by some vague set of values and purposes um but unlimited geographically so that there's lots of different flavors so like okay you want to be doing a regenerative village project well we've got seven of those would you prefer British Columbia or Portugal, you know? Um, or you want to do an entrepreneurial ecosystem? Okay, well, there's these other places um, or these ones that are completely online uh, uh, that you have kind of like lots of different flavors and a sense of extended family between them uh, so that you can say, oh, well, I've been involved in this community in Austin and that kind of gives you instant access in Berlin. Um, because there's shared language in the same way that, you, that like the burner community works like that, exactly like that. Like you can, you can go in just about any city these days and search up uh, who's a, who's a burner and you'll find good people to hang out with. Um, it's like a, it's, it's like a new kind of citizenship almost. Mm -hmm. I see it like that. And I don't know if it's going to be micro solidarity precisely, or if that's just my ego trip. Um, but this idea of like extended communities of practice where people are trying to do uh, life and love and work and doing it in a collaborative way. I think that's just kind of happening. Um, and I don't know like what's the best role for me to play in it, but at the moment, um, yeah, at the moment it's fun to like trying to articulate this sort of passport. <laughs> what's the sort of bottleneck or constraint right now on spreading micro solidarity as, as far as you can tell? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a hunch, uh, but I, I just want to be clear. <laughs> like, I don't know any of these things. I know about my experience, but um, these questions are so complex and subjective, you know. Um, mm -hmm. but, but just my best guess at the moment, one of the things is about lineage. Like, like I said about the example within Spiral, I inherited that. You know, I didn't... I didn't do something to create the shared leadership culture. I got there for free. I sustained it by my participation, how I show up, but I didn't create it. Um, and, and actually not just that, like I got it for free, but prior to Inspiral, if I didn't have that context, I would have been actively interrupting the shared leadership culture. Like if I, if I hadn't been in that training ground where people were like getting to know me and helping to like shape my personal development, I would have interrupted the process of shared leadership. Um, and so I've got this whole cohort of people that inspire all, but then also where did they come from? You know, where did they learn those skills? And, and, and I, I keep saying this, but one day I'm going to really trace the lineage back a long way and see, cause I'm, I'm sure there's some magic stories in there. Um, but I do think that we are dealing with a kind of culture which is passed face-to-face, -face, hand to hand. And it doesn't, you can't put it into a PDF, you can't put it into a website. 
Um, it has to come from this contact. And it's a bit like sourdough, maybe. Like you can start a sourdough from scratch by just like leaving the ingredients out on the, on the bench and like some yeast will land in there from the air and you'll make something. Um, but there are also specific kinds of sourdough which have been like the same culture has been continuously incubating for like hundreds of years. And you can't download that. You have to go to the source and get a piece of it and bring it into your own context. Um, so it is possible for people to start with our lineage. It's just going to be a bit random. <laughs> and if you can start, if you can start from a starter culture that's actually mature and, and highly evolved, I think it's much more likely that your group's going to go well. So um, the things that I've decided to put into the framework versus the majority of things which I've left out are saying like, if you just do this, this is my best guess, but if you just do this, I think you're likely to avoid all the early traps and get to a sustaining, thriving group that can then have its own uh, stamina and strength to be able to deal with whatever challenges come your way. If you don't do these things, you might, you might make it, you might not, but you're, you're, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, you might be perfectly safe to not get vaccinated, but I got vaccinated. I would prefer to have, I'd prefer to have the dose to make it less likely that I'm going to really get harmed by this pandemic. It's a bit like that. I, I think um, there's something really special about what happened in New Zealand. Um, that, that means there's some kind of quality of relationship there, both like interpersonal relationship and then collective organizing. That's just different from most of the places I visited. And that's, I think it's one of the starter cultures to share from. I think it's this, this peculiar relationship in New Zealand between indigenous people and settler people, which while, you know, it was colonization, it is still traumatic. There's a huge amount of harm done. In the, in the global scheme of things, the relationship between indigenous and settler people there is more harmonious than most other places. I think that has made a positive contribution to how we be in groups. And um, so I think we've got some to offer. I think there's other sources as well. That's not, I really don't want to claim like we're the only one. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're not connected to any lineage, you're not likely to, you're less likely to succeed as a group. Um, so that's one bottleneck is just like who has access. And so that means we need to be able to create spaces for people. I mean, we're doing this little two week training that you mentioned. It gives you a taste. It gives you a little reference point of like, oh, this is the vibe. This is the flavor we're going for. Something about the way that Nati and I are relating to each other through that process sets a, a role model for you to go like, all oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You already know this, but you, you get a, um, a clear picture. And you're like, yeah, that's something to calibrate against. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff we can't do on Zoom that we need three or four days together to go into like deep process. Uh, and that there's just so, so many more opportunities to demonstrate a particular way of being for people to really pick it up and for them to see their own obstacles that they have um, to, to relating in that way. And, and then it's like at the moment, um, it's me, I've got a few peers where I feel like these people are holding me up, but I'd love to have an abundance of peers, you know, and that, that each of us doing this work have an abundance of peers. And most of us that are doing it are pretty isolated. Like as far as who's actually got the experience and the skill to empathize with the challenge that I'm facing as a community leader right now. A lot of people are, that are doing that work only have like one or two people and I'd love them to have 50 and a sense of like, oh, there's an abundance of places I can go and just share vulnerably about what I'm dealing with and vent all of my frustrations about what it's like to be in that role and get good support. Um, so I think that's one of the bottlenecks, but then probably there's many more bottlenecks, which is just about my own uh, neuroses and peculiarities and my inability to receive help and these kind of things. I don't know. <laughs> you <Sure>. Tell me. <laughs> so I'm hearing like partly it's sort of in-person time with an existing, uh, you know, sourdough culture as it were. And then also uh, sort of at the congregation scale, like peers that are also uh, have experience and skills in creating congregation scale communities that you can lean on. 
Yeah. I think there's also a little rebellion in me that says there is no bottleneck. It's mm -hmm. going, it's growing at exactly the right rate. And mm -hmm. I've got no complaints. I want to, I want to um, honor that voice as well. It's <laughs> like, it's, it's growing really beautifully and it's just such a joy to watch it. Yes. Yeah. I uh, relate to that part. It, it strikes me that, um, it, you know, hearing you talk about um, the, the sort of admixture of the indigenous culture and the settler culture in New Zealand and like how that's um, created a specific sort of uh, occasion for uh, these kinds of practices to arise in a certain way is uh, at the same time, like the just how beautiful the internet is and how much is made possible that, yeah, even if you can't have in-person connections, you know, you and I have not yet met in person, for example, maybe one day we will, <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, like so much is made possible by the, the internet and um, fascinating things are, are happening there that are really beautiful, I think. Yeah. Um. There's another bottleneck um, potentially, which is just like, how does someone get paid mm. to do the community building work? Um, because uh, at Inspiral, most of my community building has been resourced out of um, spare time and, and a sense of like, people have been very generous with me, so I'm going to be generous back to the community and I'm willing to volunteer, um, which is fine. It's good. Come, there's a lot of benefits to doing things that way. But um, if we want people to really commit to the hard job of like holding a community together for multiple years, they need an income. And um, it's like, yeah, I'm getting some income from running trainings. Um, that's one source, but you have to, you know, that's kind of an investment to be able to get to that point. Um, I'd really love it. And this is, this is a kind of short-term dream that I think could, could come true. I'd love to be in a position where I can basically qualify community builders and say, hey, we've got this fund and now this is your job and you're paid at least a, a basic wage to just, this is your thing now. You don't have to hustle for money. Like you just make the community go good. Uh, I think that would make a big difference if, if people were able to treat it as their main job and not just doing it on the evenings and weekends. Because we're really asking for an extremely skilled job with a lot of commitment. Um, so it's kind of unrealistic to expect that's only going to come out of people's spare time or like people that have got rich on crypto or something. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of... Uh economic model that you anticipate or hope might develop around these kinds of structures? Yeah, there's one which feels um, worth trying at least, which is about focusing on the events and saying like every six months, we have a very high quality gathering, which is 50% of training, 50% a kind of open space, community driven, co-created, do what you want thing. Um, and the training has to be good enough that people are willing to pay like a decent sum of money because they're like, I get transferable skills. It's not just about connecting with people I care about. I'm actually going to really upskill in a bunch of stuff that is valuable to me. Um, and then the open space co-creative time is like, this is where ownership and belonging kicks in. Uh, the problem with open space is it's hard to get people to pay for it because <laughs> it's like they're bringing all of the work. <laughs> so who are they paying? Um, but yeah, I, I think we can use, like, we can use these retreat moments, these gathering moments as this peak of attention and obtain a yield, as they say in permaculture, like make that a surplus generating event. Um, and you know, you do creative things so that you're not alienating people who don't have money. You can do sliding scale ticket prices and stuff, but really set the goal of, which is what we're going to be doing with the coming events. Um, can we generate a surplus? Uh, and use that to then fund the community building in the intervening period between events. So we'll see how that goes. It's still like, as soon as you get money, you get peculiar dynamics that have to be managed. So I'm not sure what the side effects are they gonna be. Um, and I mentioned crypto as well, because I think there's uh, opportunities for, there's just so much random funny money going around in crypto that um, I think it's gonna be possible to just kind of, I mean, in the last three days, they've raised $35 million to buy a copy of the constitution. And when I say they, I mean a completely decentralized network of Twitter people, um, which is kind of like just having a good story and, and the right meme at the right time. And then the coordination infrastructure to say, we're doing this, who wants to chip it in? And I think something like that could happen 
for micro solidarity, either through that kind of very widely decentralized crowdfunding or by, I do know now an increasing number of really wealthy people. So it's kind of on me to tell the story at the right time to the right people when it's mature enough and make the ask. I think that'll just open up philanthropic funding, which is not a business model, but it does um, create some ease for people. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, it's kind of like, we've done a lot of experimentation at Inspiral and I don't think we've really found a satisfying answer beyond various kinds of volunteering a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, I, I've seen about this sort of constitution fundraiser thing uh, with crypto, but uh, do you know what the specific mechanisms that they're using to gather that money are? Uh, not in a huge amount of detail, but basically it's like, um, because of the way smart contracts work on the blockchain, you can just say, if this, then that, you can do this conditional commitment. So if we reach this target, then this amount of money is going to be debited from your account and we're going to buy the thing and you're going to have governance rights in proportion to the amount that you contributed. And so it's like this very trustworthy algorithmic style of governance, which means, and not just the governance, but also the financial pipes are all done through crypto. So there's this, this like international by default, frictionless, permissionless, anyone who trusts that contract can sign up for it and participate. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of, yeah, like I say, it's frictionless, you know, it's like just the, the, the easiest possible way to get people to participate. And then on top of that, you have a bit of tweeting, a bit of meme, meme power. That's basically the coordination infrastructure as far as I know. I don't think there's any like legal entity. Maybe they have got, maybe someone has had to now to participate in the auction side of things, but um, it's mostly done through code. Hmm. Yeah, I would love to see that sort of infrastructure become uh, commonplace and ubiquitous and uh, you know able to be deployed locally within a small group uh, kind of at will, that would be, I think a lot of possibilities would open up if that, I mean, you know, I, I, um, I think that's a lot of the intention of some crypto projects. It's just not, um, it's not at that ubiquitous stage yet where it's, it's commonplace for that sort of thing to happen. So it's exciting to see such a like huge example of that sort of thing. And, uh, that sort of signals to me that that might become possible in the, in the future of, uh, smaller local scale, ubiquitous, common, well understood, deployed versions of that that are for specific things. Like, you know, I don't, I don't really personally resonate with purchasing the constitution. I can see why people would, but uh, but like there are things that I would resonate with that would be much more local and, um, you know, oh, I wanna fund you doing a gathering or, oh, I wanna fund this person's, uh, you know, hobby project or, or whatever it is. And uh, I think, you know, Patreon's kind of like maybe a good example of that sort of thing in the like sort of, older or older style and it'd be interesting to see what new possibilities might arise with crypto yeah yeah i think it's worth saying as well you know like in my um, personal journey through my career i started with technology and going like ah there must be so many opportunities to build coordinating technology that's going to accelerate collaboration mm -hmm. which there are but um it's not random that i wound up doing community building you mm -hmm. know it's like that was the conclusion of oh okay the more interesting opportunities are in culture. They're in how do people relate to each other. For me, I mean, there's going to be great opportunities for coordinating technology, but um, there's just, I think there's going to always be so much of governance and collaboration, which is eligible to computers, which is just purely about vibes and trust and the embodied feeling of what is it like to be with someone and do I trust them or not? Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't, you just can't get a technical view on that. And um and, and the sort of risk of crypto and DAOs and these things is the technology is so shiny, it kind of gives you this wish that, oh, we might be able to solve all the challenging parts of human relationship if we just had the right technology. And it's really good at these short-term one-off things like we're going to crowdfund $35 million in three days. Um, but what happens if the people who are behind that crowdfund have some strained relationships? Like what's going what's to support them? It's not going to be a smart contract. Yeah, I think having like good social technology available, like, you know, like the micro solidarity framework is uh, what will make those things work or not. And uh, 
yeah, it's it's within that context that I'd be excited about uh, actual technolo technological developments that aren't just like shiny, flashy stuff, but stuff that's like boring, you know, uh, like electricity is boring. Uh, you know, at this point, Zoom is boring, right? Like we, there's no uh, spectacle to us getting on a Zoom call to have this conversation. Like that, that's the kind of ubiquity that I'd want. Mm -hmm. And in that place, I think really good, strong social technologies would be ha have their place of, yeah, this is how we meet in small groups. And this is what a caller is or an intention or, yeah, we're going to bound this to a certain time or, or whatever. Um, and within that, like that's the conditions for good, good consequences to arise, I think. Yeah. And you know, Zoom was boring even before the pandemic started. Uh, yeah, it was at that level of that level of maturity that when we finally needed it, yeah. it was like, ah, oh, yeah, we've got this. A lot of people have already got this. We already know it's already deployed. Yeah, <laughs> it just sets the time horizon. You know, it's like it, it could be a few years off before. <laughs> yeah, before we're there with these kind of doubts. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Are there any uh, new sort of things that you're experimenting with on the social technology side? Like I, I know there are a number of things that you sort of tried and did within the, the cohort of the micro solidarity framework. Is there anything that you've been trying that's new for you? I think the, the new thing, well, one thing is I haven't had that much time to do new stuff lately. And so mm -hmm. um, both Nutsi and I have like putting down a whole bunch of client work to make space for creativity and, and new developments. Um, and so what's new for me, I guess there's two parts. One is new collaborators. So um, the gathering we're gonna run in Belgium in May, and potentially there's gonna be one in the States in like October, November. Uh, we'll be collaborating with this super rad dude, Carl Stayat, who's a internal family systems trainer and general awesome dude. Um, so that's, that's kind of like adding more depth on the therapeutic side as well as the conflict resolution side and he's just got tons of experience with um you know people in co-living villages and like he adds a whole dimension and he's going to be coming in in quite a significant way i think next year so that will open up um a lot of practices that come with that uh, whereas you know so far the ifs for example we've just done tiny little taster of like oh this is a useful metaphor do parts work but to have someone who's really competent to, to do the therapeutic stuff where it gets more painful, that's really cool. Uh, and then this, the side that's more about what I'm doing is a, yeah, I'm, I'm attempting at the moment to, to draft a kind of competency framework or a, a, a developmental pathway where, you know, if you forgive me, let's assume that I'm, I'm, the, I'm the most qualified micro solidarity practitioner in the world because I invented the system, so I need to be at the top. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and then you've got someone who's just heard about it and they're really excited. It's like, what's, uh, what's one logical path for them to get from where they are to have the skills that I have? I'm laying all that out and articulating it and trying to deal with my own triggers about hierarchy along the way. Sort of like uh, a skill tree that you're building? Yeah. 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 Um, and it's really fun. It's really exciting. It does, like I say, it's a bit it's a bit self-triggering because there's a bunch of hierarchical dimensions to that. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to articulate the skills and then another to like put the, how do we immunize this against coercive power dynamics? That's mm -hmm. the next layer that goes on top of it. Um, but that's coming together in a way that I'm quite excited about because this process is just like ever increasing clarity, removing the implicit, removing my own internal bias or just like assumptions and putting them on paper where people can see them. And it's like, oh, I do that, right, okay. If I wanna, if I want X, then I must Y. Well, not must, but like, this is one way to get there. Um, yeah, I'm quite jazzed about that. So I, I can see people, um, I don't think it'll be like formal certification or qualification or something, but informally having a sense of like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of at this stage of my journey and there's three other stages that I'd, I'd get to before I could really feel competent to host a group of 150 or, you know, that um, just to orient people to where they are and, and, and what's a logical pathway. I think that's quite exciting. Uh, so I suspect that's going to be a big chunk of my work over the next six months or so. Hmm. What's in the skill tree that you're, that you're aware of now? Sounds like you're still mapping it out, but what, what's in there now? Yeah. Um, because it's me, uh, it's all mapped in terms of fractal group sizes. Hmm. 
So, um, well, first you have like a baseline requirement prerequisite for anyone that's participating at any level is what I call interior curiosity. And there's lots of language for this thing, but this, it's like both the capacity and the willingness to look inwards. So for example, say there's a conflict. Are you completely attached to what's happening outside of you? Or are you also able to in interrogate yourself not even, I'm not even taking, so talking about taking responsibility. I mean, like, can you describe the feelings that are happening for you while you're in this conflict? You know, that's the baseline. Can you, can you look inwards? Uh, do you have some curiosity about what's happening inside of you? Or are you completely focused outwards? Because that, in our work with groups, Nati and I, over the last five years, there's a small number of people, but a noticeable number of people that are not willing or not able to do that. Um, or at least not able in that context where we've met them. And we just can't really help if you're not willing to do that bit or not able to do that part. That's like the baseline requirement, uh, which you can cultivate in so many different ways, right? Like meditation practices and therapy and having good role models and parenting and like lots of different stuff. Um, and then from there, it just kind of goes up in order of group size. So uh, there's a, what do you need? What are the skills you need to host a crew? Uh, not much some facilitation, like basic facilitation of, this is the process we're gonna run. Uh, I got all your emails together. I scheduled a meeting. I got the Zoom thing, you know, there's like, um, there's not a huge amount, but I've been on a few calls lately where the person calling didn't know the basics and they're really painful and it feels like a waste of time. It's very demotivating. Um, so there's like some basic skills there that are required before you can host a crew. And before you're really competent as a, as a crew host, you probably just need to do that a bunch of times. You just need some experience. And you'll know you're competent when other people enthusiastically recommend you for the role. You know, people are like, yeah, you'd be great at that. Um, and so that's, that's we're talking like five people. And five people, you're playing on the easy level because it's quite easy to develop shared context. Like there's this really great interview, uh, which I recommend between uh, Robin Dunbar on the Jim Rutt show. Uh, came out recently and and he really explains the magic of five people for example he says um shakespeare never wrote a scene with more than five people talking to each other because he he could tell he knew from his observation of humans like five people can hold mutual shared context of all the other five people their perspectives but seven people can't so if you're at a table with five and then two other people sit down the conversation will always split into two or three groups because we just can't keep state with five people well, we can, but you need an agenda and a facilitator and like all these prosthetic structures to help keep context. So working at that group of five level is easy <laughs> because you can all just come into sync with each other and you don't even need to describe what that state is. It's just held implicitly in the field between you. Um, so then there's a whole bunch of skills that happen that you need once you hit 50 people or 15 maybe even where you no longer have that easy level um, where you have to yeah, hold state, which might involve writing things down, making decisions, having some kind of communication technology, having some way of orienting people when they show up. And like I said, trust is going to break down at a certain level. So then you need skills of conflict mediation. And the bigger the group gets, the more you're going to need systems of accountability. And um, like I said, money systems, there's all these kind of like, basically the more people you involve, the more skills are going to be required. Um, so, so what I'm doing is, is trying to set some thresholds and say, if you've done this much, you should be qualified to do this really well. And once you feel competent there, then try the next thing. This is the next challenge for you. Um, and there's somewhere around 50 or 150 people where I, I feel I need to be surrounded by peers that I don't have more than like three of where I feel like they've really mastered the game. I've got some in New Zealand, but I mean, in Europe, um, so I'm articulating all of this, the skill tree so that I can have some more competent friends to play with. And, and part of the reason for this is like, to put it glibly, I don't really care about someone's opinion about how society should be organized differently if they don't know how to organize 50 people. It's like, you're gonna have some interesting ideas for sure as like a you know radical, political, you've got some ideas. But if you haven't personally encountered the paradoxes and the trade-offs of what it's actually like to organize people, 
like your ideas are going to be really simplistic in lots of ways. So I'm just looking forward to the day where I can be in a group where I know that everyone here knows how to organize 50 people and then potentially keep going up that ladder of like, oh, everyone here knows how to organize a network of 50 groups of 50 people. Awesome. What are our opinions about how the world should be organized? Like, I think those are going to be pretty high quality. <laughs> uh -huh. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, this is making me reflect on like um, something that I've really wrestled with a lot in the last couple of years, and especially as things have been on Zoom or is how much I typically dislike uh, group things. Uh, and I much prefer this, like a one-to-one -one connection because, uh, yeah, that, that's my ideal social connection is one-to-one -one because there's like a hundred percent shared context and uh, you can kind of like meet the needs of both people. And I think that, you know, sort of makes me a skilled at doing this sort of thing, these one-on-one -on -one conversations, but um, I really don't like group things as much and have been really grateful for micro solidarity because that's, that's sort of given a framework for uh, maybe what's missing in a lot of those contexts where it's like, oh yeah, we have a shared intention and there's going to be, we're going to meet for in this structure for this long and have this format. And like, I noticed when that sort of structure is held, it is a lot easier for me of like, okay, uh, for example, there's going to be time for me to speak, you know, or, or time to hear from each person. Um, it's like, I think it's like weirdly, maybe not weirdly, but surprisingly to me, like that the absence of that is, is stressful to be like, oh, not necessarily that I need to speak, but like, will I be able to speak uh, or will each, well, I hear also, will I hear from other people? Is there, is there someone that's just going to be quiet the whole time because there isn't space for them and that kind of thing. And I think there's a few other things there, but um, I'd be curious. Uh, yeah. To hear if you have any reflections on that of like, uh, on the one hand, I'm really comfortable with the one-to-one -one, and then on the other hand, like, Oh, groups. Yeah. I don't, I don't typically like groups as much. Well, let's get to the, back to the apocalyptic framing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, um... I don't think one-to-one -one conversations are going to result in the kind of energy transformation and economic transformation that we need mm. uh, and restoration of ecosystems and so on. A lot of that work is going to be achieved by large groups moving in unison. Mm. And at the moment, most of the people you see that are willing to move in large groups in unison are, well, let's put it politely and say they, they tend to be on the far right. Um, and the, the people with more progressive values and ecological values are largely very dysfunctional in groups. Mm. And uh, my proposition is that part of this is about having nested fractal collective identities so that you're mostly attached to your little squad, but you're also attached to a congregation and that congregation is also attached to a bigger network and that's attached to a bigger movement. And that um, there's a kind of articulation between these different scales. So like the, the mental model I have because of my engineering background, it's like a, um, a robotic arm where like you might be a fingertip and you're attached to a finger, which is attached to a hand, to a forearm, to an elbow, to a shoulder, to a body. And um, there's a lot that you can do as a fingertip, you know, some of the most fun things in your life can be achieved with this little motion. <laughs> um, but, you know, after this call, I'm going to go cook dinner and I'm going to use my whole body. You know, there's some things where you need to act in unison. Um, the other metaphor, which is maybe less tasteful is um, thinking about an army. Like there are, there are strategies, there are moments where an army needs to move a million people in lockstep more or less. And then there are other moments where the army needs to break down into groups of four and those four, those groups of four need to be autonomous and making their own decisions. And then they need to be able to move between those two states instantaneously. I think that's what a, a, a sane reaction to climate change and ecological disaster looks like is the ability to uh, move the right joint at the right time. So like there are some problems which are neighborhood problems. There are some which are global there are some which are in your family, you know, there, there's just all these different scales. And something that's happened over the last like century or so is all of our imagined communities have disintegrated and we're just left with like, I'm an individual consumer with no attachment to other people. 
And so people have re- like, there's just such boring, naive conversations about climate change where it's like, oh, personal responsibility or the government should do it. It's like, yes. And like, <laughs> there's all of these different scales that we need to be able to act. And, and we can't, um, we can't address, we can't mobilize that collective action if there's not a collective identity. So these collective action problems, which are like choking us at the moment, are collective identity problems. Mm. And my, my view on collective identity is these nested circles. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking about, as you speak about that, of like how, um, yeah, we do think of ourselves as individuals and think that's a strength and a weakness. And like, if you look at, I'm thinking of like getting the image in my mind of like birds flocking and like birds know how to flock together and uh, it seems like there could be a analogous thing for humans where we are able to move in these huge groups, but still retain the benefits of being individuals as well. And, but there's not a clear image that comes to mind that like r- reflects that in the same way that a flock does for birds or something like that, or, you know, a sea of fish or whatever that still shows the individuality in the same way. Um, but I've been sensing for some time that something like that is, is possible for us at this time. You know, the rules that govern a school of fish or a, a flock of birds, they all are about the relation between the birds. They don't give an instruction to an individual bird that says you need to develop the skill or that skill. It's like, you need to track your distance from the other people and maintain equidistance between three of them or something like that. It's all mm-hmm. about how are you relating to the others? That's, the, that's where you get this emergent behavior come from is the simple rules which are gov- governing the links, not the nodes, the interactions between them. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess to be fair to humans, I know, I know we do do this sort of thing, but like we have, we have maybe could do it better or something like that. Uh, it's not that we don't do it, but um, it feels almost unconscious or uh, less structured than it could be, or um, or at this particular moment in time, like there, there are structures that could arise that would be good that currently don't exist or aren't evenly distributed or something like that yeah i feel like i want to say as well you know with my robot metaphor um i don't have this vision that we're going to organize everyone into this great robot and that's how we deal with climate change Mm -hmm. um i really appreciated kim stanley robinson's latest book ministry for the future because he sort of just demonstrates a way that we might get away with climate change sort of solve it sort of with all of these different actors, some of whom are working at cross purposes, um, but they're all being effective. That's the thing. And there's like multiple different agents, but they're all being effective. And so like, I imagine many of these robot arms, you know, like um, I imagine the next Occupy movement playing out with the same level of chaos that it had, but that just there's a bit, there's a few more people that are better resourced in conflict mediation, that are better resourced in decision-making that are like, yeah, have, have access to money or whatever they've got better relationships with people in power, like the same chaos that we keep seeing, the same like burbling craziness that is humanity, um, but just a bit more mature, a bit more competent, a bit more fluid in its articulation and ability to move. Um, if, if we can pull that off, then I sort of feel like the big challenges that we face, that we only need a tiny little upgrade, very widely distributed, mm. and we'll be in a much better position for confronting these kind of massive challenges we face. Yeah, right, right. I like that. Uh, Yeah, it's sort of hopeful. Um, Is there anything uh, related to any of the topics that we've talked about that you'd like to say more about or talk more about? I don't think so. I think most of the stuff at the moment is like, I'm in a phase where I really just need time uh, without distraction to the whole, write a whole bunch of stuff and then publish it and then look forward to people upgrading it by their responses. So uh, there's all these like half finished thoughts, which don't really feel ready to share. Mm. Um, I think the main thing on my mind is like, yeah, we did that cohort of Twitter, Twitter people coming in and uh, joining us and making more meaningful connections. And I, I imagine that a good number of your audience are part of the Twitter extended archipelago of Mm in-groups and I just want to call to them like do the friendship thing take the 
take take that risk you know like make that step to to move beyond superficial enjoyable but superficial relationships and actually do a bit of mutual exposure and mutual obligation it's really good stuff and also really planting the seed of like we're going to be gathering in belgium in may we're probably going to be gathering maybe in vermont is my vision mm. in maybe the first week of november next year wow Vermont. Like, it's it's not firmly committed yet but i really want to anchor these places and say like come in fam let's get together let's make it work um because yeah i do feel hopeful when when i look to the side and see there's a lot of us with our hearts pointing in the same direction and starting to work out how to put our hands and our minds to work as well like it's really exciting and um yeah i i, I want to extend my hospitality to a lot of people and then reciprocate and have their hospitality extended in the opposite direction. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you all. I'm excited to hear about the meetup in Vermont. Uh, you know, it's sort of been a home to me for many years, so I'll keep my eyes on that. And uh, yeah, thank you for talking with me today. It's lovely to hear more about kind of the background for these things and um, sort of connect some dots. And I've been enjoying applying them to, you know, in my own context and we'll be continuing to do that. So thank you for talking with me today. Uh, it's such a pleasure and please do let me help you know when you're applying these things and they don't go very well uh, <laughs> and you get into these painful moments like i really love i really love debugging any kind of group problem mm. and this goes for anyone listening as well like if you've got a group problem uh the, the the offer if we're friends send me a private message we'll get in touch we'll have a conversation if we're not friends yet do it in public <laughs> like any kind of um uh, collaboration advice needed on a public Twitter thread. I'm I'm there. I'm I'm all about it. Mm, I love that. Thank you for making that offer and uh, making it clear how uh, people can ask for your help. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's very specific for me. Like if I get a message from someone I don't know, it feels like work. If it's private, but if it's public, it's like yeah, I I have good ideas about this. Let me tell you. Totally. <laughs> yeah. We all have our our. Uh stuff around this the things that work for us and things that don't so appreciate you knowing what works for you yeah okay well thanks for talking to me rich Pleasure.